Good morning and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar today on the lessons from Australia, integrating high levels of renewable energy and distributed energy resources on the grid. My name is Chris Yelland and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence okay. and I will be your host at this webinar signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to our presenters who will be introduced to you in due course. I'm also sharing a link with you now in the Teams, or sorry, the Zoom chat facility where you can download the presenter biographies. So look in the Zoom chat facility and you'll see the link which you can then download the bios. The program for the day has also been widely circulated. But a link to download the program will be shared now on the Zoom chat facility as well. Again, uh, please feel free to download the program. Uh, it has been sent to you previously. And of course, a big welcome to you today for your interest and participation. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence and the Power Futures Lab at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business. I would also like to acknowledge and thank Investec Bank, GET Transform, GIZ, the South African German Energy Program, and the South African Independent Power Producers Association for their most valued support and participation in this webinar and for the great work that they do in this field. About 1,100 delegates have registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This really attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered and the stature of the presenters. May I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort that they have put in. Please do note uh, that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentations are in progress, please do send your questions on the Zoom Q&A text facility and not on the Zoom chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. We've set aside about 45 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, the share of variable solar and wind energy on the grid is growing rapidly in South Africa. And this creates new challenges for market and system operation, including ensuring adequate quality and reliability of supply, as well as appropriate pricing signals. Distributed energy resources such as rooftop solar PV and batteries are multiplying and are also creating challenges around system stability. But alongside demand side resources, they are also offering new opportunities through virtual power plants and smart participation in new power markets, including for ancillary services. Australia now has one of the highest grid penetrations of solar and wind energy and distributed energy resources globally. Professor Anton Eberhard recently led a study tour to Australia of senior executives in NERSA, Eskom, Metropolitan Municipalities, and SALGA, the South African Local Government Association, to learn from their experience. These lessons will be shared in the webinar, and some of the experts uh, uh, they met will make presentations today. ESCOM and local government distributors will also share their perspectives. So to get the ball rolling, Professor Anton Eberhardt will now make an opening address and give his insights and background on the subject at the hand. Anton is an emeritus professor at the Power Futures Lab of the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business. His research, teaching, and advisory work 
focuses on governance and regulatory incentives to improve utility performance, power investment challenges, the design of new power markets, renewable energy and distributed energy resources. Anton has worked in the renewable energy and energy sector itself across Sub-Sahara Africa and other developing regions for more than 40 years. And he was the founding director of the Energy and Development Research Center. He has served on the National Planning Commission and the board of the regulator NERSA. So without further ado, I will now call on Anton to deliver his opening address. Anton, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris, for that introduction. And thank you so much for co-hosting this webinar with our Power Futures Lab at uh, the University of Cape Town. As Chris mentioned, uh, in December last year, I had the privilege of leading a study tour down to Australia to look at these issues of what we can learn from that country around integrating high levels of renewables and distributed energy resources on the grid. Uh, we had uh, senior officials uh, and managers from the presidency, uh, from ESCOM, from the regulator NERSA, uh, from SALGA, and from three metros, from Etiquini, Nelson Mandela, and Cape Town, uh, that joined us on, on that tour. The tour was uh, funded by GIZ, and I'd like to express our appreciation for their uh, generous support. So just firstly, quickly, uh, a, a bit of scene setting here um, to see the differences between Australia uh, and the similarities with South Africa. So a population of around 23 million compared to our 60 million, but the electricity peak demand is more or less the same as our winter demand, 36 gigawatts, but much higher levels of wind, 10 gigs, uh, utility scale solar, about 10 gigs, but here's the big difference. Uh, so rooftop solar now approaching 20, 20 gigawatts uh, and millions of homes uh, with rooftop. Uh, they have obviously a much more mature and sophisticated power market. It's an energy only market. Um, and because of these high proportions of solar and wind experience negative prices for 9% of the time in the national electricity market, that's uh, the, the, that east and southern coast. So that's Queensland, New South Wales, uh, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania, where the bulk of their electricity demand is. And that could be negative prices up to 17% of the time in South Australia. It's interesting to look at a typical electricity bill, which would be made up about 35% uh, of uh, energy costs, the wholesale energy costs. Uh, the network costs are surprisingly high, 46% of the bill for for transmission and distribution, they're subject to revenue cap regulation. And in some, some view, perhaps uh, Professor Mountain can talk about that a bit, uh, uh, I think represents some kind of regulatory failure or capture, seeing, seeing those high prices there. Environmental costs around 8% uh, and retail and residual costs about 11%. So there's full retail competition. But I think there's also a realization that not everyone can participate in that market. Not everyone has information uh, uh, around choices or, or understands the market well. And so every retailer must have a default contract offer uh, at a regulated price, which is available to consumers as well. It's also a very unbundled system. So unlike our big vertically integrated ESCOM, uh, even at the networks level, uh, a very significant uh, unbundling there. Uh, and a mix of ownership. So you can see in Queensland and Brisbane there, it's public ownership uh, as it is mostly in Western Australia and Perth. In contrast to South Australia and Victoria, which are all privately owned distributors and transmission companies. And then in New South Wales, uh, Sydney area, a, a mix of, of, of the two. Great solar resources like South Africa, amongst the, the best in the world and not bad uh, wind resources as well. And this has resulted in our very ambitious targets to decarbonize and add more solar and wind on the system as coal declines. Uh, they've set a target of 82% of renewables by um, 2030, uh, and they've recently announced this capacity investment scheme where nine gigs of storage, 23 gigs of variable renewables need to be tendered uh, and contracted by 2027 
that implies running these competitive tenders every six months. Uh, and this is uh, supported by very significant government underpinning. So there's a floor price uh, below which they'll support these IPPs and a ceiling price. Uh, uh, perhaps Bruce can correct me here, but my understanding is uh, that is shared, uh, if you go above that price in the market, benefits are shared equally between the IPP and government. So the penetration has been very significant uh, in the, the NEM, the National Electricity Market, uh, and, and very rapidly over the last few years. So you can see, in principle, renewables could supply up to 98% of, of electricity demand at peak. Uh, in practice, that has reached a, a peak of about 70% uh, at specific times. And then you can see in South Australia, which is the really the lead, how quickly that uh, transformation has been. Renewables taking up an increasingly share. Um, 2022, up to 68% of total electricity produced uh, and aiming by 2028 to be 100%. And some of you would have seen this uh, chart. It's been widely reproduced where in South Australia, renewable energy uh, uh, at uh, many times, uh, uh, 282 days, there were moments where uh, solar and wind uh, produced more than 100% uh, of, 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 uh, of the electricity demand at times. And that was uh, over a 12-month period, 24% uh, of the time, uh, it, it met, met um, more than 100%. And if you look at the cumulative contribution of renewables in South Australia in that period, 71%. Uh, and there are times, and this, this was really uh, something that I hadn't appreciated, there are times when rooftop solar alone meets that, that, that total demand uh, in, in, uh, in, in South Australia and very significant proportion in Western Australia. And of course, the, the impact on residual demand uh, that the rest of the system has to meet is this typical uh, duck curve, and you see the belly of the duck gets uh, saggier and deeper. Uh, the more you add solar during during midday, and then these very steep ramp times. And I'm, I'm delighted that Gabriel Caper is has joined us and will be speaking later. And she developed these rather lovely diagrams where we can see the typical duck di diagram becomes a bit of a sleeping duck uh, if you start adding batteries, which ameliorates those evening peaks and could even become a platypus if you then add uh, trading options uh, in, into that as well. So th these high proportions of renewables are, are challenging on the grid, the issues of lack of inertia as you decommission the spinning synchronous machines, uh, the issue of uh, maintaining voltage control, we'll speak about that quite a bit, the issue of interconnectors, which is in very important for places like South Australia, uh, reverse power flows, uh, exceeding the network's hosting capacity, negative pricing that I've told you about, and then electrification of demand. We'll also speak a little bit more about that uh, and its implications for the for, for peak demand. So what struck us in, in our visit, and, and uh, this was very strong, is that there's a real can-do sort of problem-solving mindset in Australia to saying, yes, there are these challenges, uh, but we're going to progressively resolve these challenges and we'll do it in an incremental and innovative and experimental way. We will run pilots and, and uh, trials and uh, uh, progressively deepen our understanding of how to manage grids under these challenging conditions. And there was this very uh, ambitious uh, report end of 2022, a re engineering roadmap uh, towards 100% renewables, covering these sort of issues, power system security, frequency and inertia, system strength, uh, voltage control, issues around system operability, resource adequacy and, and, and capability. So what are the kinds of uh, insights uh, that we've seen from the national electricity market um, that perhaps are relevant to South Africa? And, and going through these, it struck me that they stand in real contrast to what we're doing in South Africa. Uh, so they set clear policy goals, uh, very clear targets for renewables there. They've established a blueprint for, for generation and transmission expansion requirements. They publish that integrated strategic plan uh, every, um, if, if, every 12 months with these very ambitious uh, tar tar targets for solar. They establish a coordinated uh, plan for non-renewable generation requirements. So what has to be there to support the variables? 
uh, planning early to identify future power system requirements. Uh, what do we need around frequency control and reserve system strength, inertia, dynamic reactive support? And then they define and enforce strong performance standards uh, for new generation. Uh, issues around importance of interconnectors between the states, internet initiating not reactively but proactively regulatory cha ch changes to accommodate these new, new innovations. Uh, seeking to trigger early investments, not ending up in, 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 in supply uh, shortages. And then these parallel pathways needed uh, uh, to, to uh, stabilize the system and achieve system strength and, and quality of, of supply. So synchronous condensers are really quite widely uh, used. Uh, Bruce Mountain will talk a little bit about that. Um, so firstly, synchronous condensers with uh, existing decommissioned uh, plant and then new ones that they've put in, and then accelerating uh, the proof and uh, scale and trying out uh, issues of, um, of grid forming batteries and, and, and inverters. So this really implies a whole shift in system operation thinking. And I think this has huge application and implications for our new transmission a company of South Africa. So traditionally, system operators are used to thinking in terms of controlling these big major assets. But now we're moving to increased distributed energy resources. These will scale to a point which requires integration into, uh, into the system. I, it struck me, it's really interesting that the Australians kind of think of these, these millions of, of rooftop solar in, in a sense as one big resource or a number of big resources that need to be managed uh, as you would a, a large power station. So new models for DER integration are required. Dynamic operating envelopes represents one uh, such model and perhaps Gabriel Caper later will speak a little bit more about this. So we really need new thinking and resourcing for, for grid operation. And if I think of the challenges facing the NTCSA in South Africa, this new subsidiary transmission company. Of course, it's mainly getting new investment into transmission, but a big thing of their, their, their um, business model going forward would be to build new capabilities within system operation in our country. So let's let's go a little bit more detail on, on the DER side. Uh, Australia is really a global leader around rooftop solar. Around 70% of Australians own their own homes. 70% of standalone dwellings, that obviously helps. Uh, about a quarter of households now have rooftop solar. That's higher in, in South Australia, where it's about a third. Three and a half million uh, homes around the country, around 20 gigs. Uh, in 2022, they added about 2.7 gigawatts. So I know these numbers in Australia seem very large, but if you think of the number of PV panels imported into South Africa last year, uh, it's of this order of magnitude. So this is something that we could start seeing uh, happen more and more. You should note that most of these systems are simply uh, rift, uh, are panels and, and inverters. So only about 10% have, have batteries, uh, and this will be a new growth area. How has this grown over time? So mostly through the small scale renewable energy uh, uh, scheme uh, where rebates have been offered uh, through these um, solar te technical certificates, which are tradable. The effect of that is to reduce the capex of these systems by about 30%. The paybacks in places like Adelaide, Sydney uh, uh, are very significant, uh, less than, than four years. And a lot of this has been facilitated by, by really uh, sta a sort of a, 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 a cookie cutter sort of approach, standardization to, uh, around the systems and equipment, the Clean Energy Council involving a training of uh, and accreditation of, of suppliers, uh, streamlined permitting, which we're beginning to see in South Africa now through, through these online portals. They have no import duties on their panels, which uh, helps the competitiveness. And this scheme has been so successful that it is now going to be scaled down heading towards 2030. So the future, as I say, batteries, more with solar PV, the electrification, degasification of heating, uh, and uh, more widespread uh, electrification use, including uh, electric vehicles, smart appliances. And because of the, the, the penetration of, of rooftop solar now, um, if for its integration and uh, for it to grow, uh, it needs to be integrated better into the system with signals from the market, 
through to the operator. We need, they need, and they're moving uh, very successfully to get much greater visibility of what's happening uh, at inverter level and, and indeed uh, behind the meter. So the whole issue of data availability uh, and control systems, metering, smart inverters, and internet of things, AI, machine learning becomes increasingly important. Uh, managing uh, those, those systems, distributed energy management system, DERMS, uh, Chris ran a, a webinar on, on this recently. Uh, and then, of course, aggregating uh, th these, these small-scale systems into virtual power plants. And so what are the key responses here? New flexible connection offers. So time of use tariffs uh, to soak up that solar sponge, that excess low-cost electricity during uh, midday. Flexible exports uh, for, for solar PV and virtual, virtual power plants. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then coming soon, the market active smart homes, flexible EV charging, uh, et cetera. Big emphasis on standards and compliance. I think this is an area that we've got to uh, take hold of. I know there's a lot of resistance to too much control by, by, by standards authorities or even distribution companies. But we need to be thinking about what are the kind of inverters, for example, we want installed, which will enable uh, this kind of flexibility and control going forward. Voltage management, I'll speak more about that in a moment. And of course, managing this residual minimum demand, managing customer uh, uh, electricity resources for system security. So flexibility is the big issue. There's a lot of spare capacity on existing networks if we can be more flexible in how we manage uh, loads uh, so and, and, and exports. So I was, I was quite intrigued to see what uh, 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 South Australia Networks is doing. They originally had a sort of five kilowatt export limit. I think this has been similar in some of the other states. And now they're saying, okay, we will offer you either a, a standard fixed 1.5 export limit or uh, you can go up to 10 kilowatts export but if you accept some level of control on your inverter. In fact, castles that are taking up this option find that it's, it's less than 5% of the time that they, they may be uh, curtailed in, in their output to manage that, that minimum uh, demand period in the middle of the day. And then this whole issue of voltage control becomes increasingly important uh, as more distributed systems go into the system. Uh, dynamic voltage management systems being employed by utilities. We see that in South Australia and Victoria and elsewhere. And then very intrigued by some of these uh, pilots that are being undertaken. This is a terrific report, really interesting to download. You can do it from PowerCore. That's one of the utilities in, in Victoria. Uh, neighborhood batteries. Uh, so these could be small, pole, or they could be larger, ground mounted. And they have these benefits of improving the network reliability, uh, increasing the, the amount of solar hosting possible. Uh, they uh, could be involved in arbitrage trading in, in, the, in the NEM. So innovative control systems can enable batteries to participate in the wholesale markets by virtual power plants uh, or, or retailers, market participants. Uh, they can mitigate peak demand. Uh, and of course, they defer network uh, in, in augmentation. And this is something that would be interesting to see happen more in South Africa. So let me just say briefly, uh, you know, a retail competition is, is extensive. I mean, there's obviously sort of the theory behind this about ideally what we want to do is to send competitive cost-reflective price signals to consumers who will rationally respond to these price signals by changing how they participate in energy markets. So as we start establishing our our power market. And we'll see these new, new contracts will include the price of electricity, of course, supplied and exported, perhaps new, going forward, volumetric limits, uh, delicated control over on-site electricity production, uh, price access and ownership of, of electricity stored off-site off as well, those community batteries, and pay, maybe even payment for ancillary services. But the assumption there that really is consumers have access to, to, to data, can work with this data and, and make efficient choices. And clearly not all will be, and particularly in our context. And so that uh, issue that I raised right at the beginning of uh, the default uh, offerings to consumers is important. 
Chris, I see you uh, giving me signals that I should uh, uh, near at my end. I've got two more slides just to summarize now. So let's think of the context, uh, the similarities and, and dissimilarities between South Africa and Australia. Uh, huge resource endowments, both countries, but obviously Australia has a much more sophisticated, mature power market. Uh, we're going, uh, uh, we're setting on that path now of setting up our market and have much to learn. Australia, obviously a richer country, faster growing, can offer more generous support. But I think we, through our load shedding, have all the incentives to be going much uh, faster on DER. And Australia has this really, I think, interesting history uh, and uh, uh, um, culture of collaboration, stakeholder engagement, particularly in the, the, the federal and, and the state levels. So it helps a lot, a lot of these moves. But of course, there's also a, a contestation, right? Some of the vested interests in fossil fuels, similar as, as we see here. Uh, renewable energy targets and support mechanisms, clearly they way out there, They're much more ambitious, much clearer. The integrated strategic plan gets published every two years. They can mobilize uh, stakeholders around us and broadly going in the same direction. Successful acceleration of, of rooftop solar through these rebates, feed-in tariffs, no import tariffs on panels, appropriate standards, um, training and accreditation, this cookie cutter approach. Uh, we can learn, I think, a lot there. What does this mean for managing the grid? I've mentioned this kind of can-do solutions focused approach, proactively exploring uh, uh, um, uh, and, and experimenting around inertia support, synchronous condensers, grid forming batteries and inverters. Bruce can talk a bit more about that, these dynamic operating envelopes. And I think important uh, because they have gas, uh, retaining some gas on the system to complement the variability of renewables. And then this opti optimum integration of distributed energy resources. Really important to have this greater visibility of what's happening on the network, so smart meters and data systems, really important customer engagement and empowerment, investing in, in the software and systems uh, around data and control, standards, regulation, I, th I think we're going to have to think carefully around the future and what kind of metering and, and uh, inverters we need. Flexible connection offers, smart active homes, aggregators, virtual power stations. Sorry, Chris, I was a bit over time. Um, uh, I know so some of the other speakers uh, will re uh, uh, reinforce some of these points and in the Q&A, we will be able to pick them up in more detail. Uh, so over and back to you, Chris. Well, thank you very much indeed, Anton Eberhardt, uh, for that really interesting introduction um, with the opening keynote presentation. And uh, a special thanks to you for leading this delegation uh, to Australia. Uh, you know, you've talked about Australia being a leader, and they are, uh, but there's also some being a follower. Uh, we can learn from the experiences of others, and I think that's what your tour to Australia was really all about. Um, we can also um, avoid some of the pitfalls um, and, uh, and and take advantage uh, also of uh, prices that are dropping uh, both in um, solar PV panels, um, in, in wind, as well as in battery energy storage. So uh, the, there's not... A, you know, the, there is a kind of an upside to being a follower, uh, and uh, we need to take advantage of, of that. And it's uh, your work and trips to Australia to learn from uh, the the leaders, uh, the people that are leading this transition, uh, that really uh, play to our advantage. So you also spoke about the can-do spirit in Australia. And yes, there are, of course, there are challenges in this whole process, many challenges. But there also are existing solutions, and there are also new emerging solutions. Uh, and we need to keep our eye on what is being done around the world, in Australia and in other um, jurisdictions. So thank you very much indeed for that uh, presentation. And I'm now going to move on to our next presenter. We're really privileged to have today Professor Bruce Mountain. Uh, he is from the Victoria Energy Policy Center in Australia. Uh, he is a uh, a former South African uh, with experience here uh, and also experience uh, globally. So Bruce is the director of the Victoria Energy Policy Center at the Victoria University in Melbourne. 
and after an undergraduate dissertation on the effects of time of use tariffs, electricity tariffs on South Africa's gold mining industry, his first job uh, was in the transmission economics division, guess what, at Eskom. He has since had a 35-year career as a consultant and researcher in policy and economics focused in the electricity sector. And he's lived and worked in England and Australia, undertaking projects in various countries. Bruce has a BSc engineering and a master of science uh, degree in electrical engineering from, guess what, the University of Cape Town. Uh, and he has professional qualifications in electrical engineering and accountancy. His PhD uh, from uh, Victoria University focused on network regulation in Australia. So it's a great privilege uh, to have you here, Bruce. Uh, if I could please ask you to share your presentation and to put it into full screen mode. Uh, and over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for asking me to speak. Um, I'm going to uh, take all of you through uh, a bunch of slides, some of which will cover similar ground to what Anton has covered and um, be keen to get questions uh, in the chat as well as to answer them afterwards um, that Chris um, collates. Briefly, um, a brief overview of the national uh, market, um, and then I'm going to comment, uh, spend the last uh, five minutes or so commenting on power system security, um, what's been done to manage that in the transition to wind and solar. So the national electricity uh, market in brief, um, it's the south and eastern states only, although it's called national, so they're five states. And most are weakly interconnected. Uh, some are strongly um, to each other, um, but as a group, they are not strongly connected. Started in 98, uh, as Anton said, the simultaneous peak demand is about 34,000 megawatts. There's 12 million connections and similar uh, aggregate energy uh, demand to um, South Africa. Uh, there's choice of retailer for about 75% of all customers. There's some regions where customers can't choose who they buy power from. And where customers have a choice, there's also a default offer, which customers can get if they don't choose to switch to a retailer. Um, the NEM is a voluntary agreement amongst the states. The states have the jurisdictional responsibility to supply electricity. So in order for the NEM to exist, they needed to agree amongst themselves to make it. The centerpiece of the NEM is, at least in the wholesale market, is a five-minute centrally settled, cash settled every day, mandatory. Everyone has to, if you're more than 30 megs big, sell your electricity into the market, energy-only spot market. Uh, the retailers buy from it every day. Some, a small number of very big customers buy from it. Um, and in addition to the spot market, which gives these five-minute prices, five-minute auctions, there are bilateral markets to hedge the volatile spot market, which can go between minus $1,000 a megawatt hour and $16,000 a megawatt hour in any five minute period. Um, much policy action happens outside the market. So although the market exists to really figure out what's going on, you really need to understand what's happening outside of it. Um, let me try and get to the next. Okay, next slide. Here's uh, some facts and figures. I'll just take you th through to 2023 on the, on the right-hand side of your screen. You can see the makeup of electricity. This is the average production in uh, megawatts um, by fuel source, hydro, uh, fairly constant, small at the bottom, solar, farmed solar, about uh, a third of wind. Uh, wind is about the same as rooftop solar, the top line, and same, roughly the same in energy terms as brown coal. Um, black coal is the biggest proportion. New South Wales and Queensland has black coal and close cycle gas turbines um, getting smaller all the time and less in energy terms than any of these other sources. Um, that rooftop solar is about the same as wind makes Australia by far in per capita energy terms, the leader in rooftop solar production. And rooftop solar will soon, I expect, be a bigger source of electricity than wind. And uh, in a few years time, perhaps bigger even than brown coal. You can see over the last 12 years how the pattern has changed over time, that, that fuel mix. 
Uh, um, South Australia in global terms is, is really quite fascinating. It's got a penetration of uh, wind, large-scale solar and rooftop solar that in aggregate meets 71% um, of end user demand in the state, uh, which is about twice as high as Portugal, which is the highest country level uh, um, at a um, global level. Victoria, the second highest VRE penetration state, is about the same as Portugal. Um, you can see in both South Australia and Victoria, wind is a dominant source, but rooftop solar, the yellow bar on the top, has been growing quickly. Um, South Australia, uh, it had coal and gas and then shifted out of coal, which closed in 2016. You can see 2016 to 2017, um, a natural gas, close cycle gas, gas turbines essentially took all of the place of, of coal, the purple bars in 2016. But you can see how that's declined over time and taking its place really has been rooftop solar and wind uh, and gas is as a proportion of the energy mix expected to continue to decline. Uh, farm solar, large scale solar, I don't think is going to grow terribly much more. Um, I think the growth will continue to be in rooftop solar and wind. Um, in cumulative terms, there's about, at the end of last year, 23 gigawatts of rooftop solar, the vast bulk of which was uh, household rooftop solar, less than 15 kilowatt, and the blue bars is CNI factories and uh, warehouses and so on. Um, about one in three eligible homes have rooftop solar, and per capita, um, about a megawatt now, uh, which is uh, about 30% uh, higher than um, the next highest globally, and uh, about twice as high as the highest in the US on the West Coast. Um, rooftop solar supplied 11% as an aggregate of grid supplied electricity in South Australia, it was 24%, and CNI is now growing quickly as well. Um, this chart combines on the right-hand side the cumulative lifetime production of the rooftop solar, which uh, is now about 50% more than energy production in the NEM for a year. But this is, of course, cumulative lifetime over the life of the panels. And the left-hand side, you can see the subsidy. Um, so those subsidies are about 17 billion Australian dollars to get it in rands multiplied by about 12. Um, those subsidies have been paid for by customers, not by the government. They've been sheeted back as a premium on top of the bill that all, almost all customers pay. And the roughly $17 billion of, of subsidy has leveraged in total about $50 billion. So about um, 600 billion rand of spending on rooftop solar. About three quarters of that total came from household. And rooftop solar has attracted much more private investment than large scale solar and about as much investment as wind. Um, batteries uh, are now significant for fast frequency response and, and um, grid support, mainly for networks. Uh, they act as a shock absorber, which allow you to run interconnectors and other transmission elements much harder, run them much closer to their thermal limits. Um, and there's about uh, 1,000 megawatts, a bit under 1,000 megawatts at the end of 2023. But you can see it's it's actually divided, if you look at the right-hand bar chart, amongst a few big ones. The VBB is a Victoria big battery, uh, which are 200 megawatts, 400 megawatt hours at the end of 2023 was the biggest. Um, batteries, which are now more than twice its size, are under construction. Um, battery sizing has been roughly doubling every year for the last five years, the biggest battery. And uh, this aggregate installed capacity is, is going to continue to grow very quickly. In aggregate, uh, it's useful, as I say, for short-term market response and for supporting the grid, um, but not so much for energy. In energy terms, the average battery uh, um, um, output, of course, it can't always output, it needs to charge and discharge. So that gives you a sense of it, was about 32 megawatts against average market demand of about 24,000 megawatts. The average storage duration is about one and a half hours. So they have enough capacity to discharge at their full rating for about an hour and a half. So to summarize the investment over the 12 years from 2012 to in 2023, about 61 wind farms were added, 7.5 gigs. 
uh, 105 solar farms, about eight gigs were added and 20 gigawatts of rooftop solar, which was an additional 2.1 million homes and businesses over the last 12 years. Total outlay is about uh, 82 billion Australian, so about a trillion rand, uh, which is about, um, let's call it 80 billion rand per year. Um, $20 billion has been set aside for interconnector expansion. That's largely locked away, although mostly not yet incurred. About four, four, four billion has already been spent. And as at N23, about a billion has been spent on battery and five billion on pumped hydro. I think about another billion on battery will be spent next year alone. Uh, Australia also has enormously big transition targets, a faster rate of change than targeted in any other rich country, OECD member country or G20 country, uh, which is that 82% of electricity production must be from clean sources by 2023. In addition to that national target, uh, states also have conditional mostly uh, state targets, which are all around uh, getting to that 100% target roughly by 2035 as a portion of energy expansion. But this is an extremely demanding target. It will require VRE expansion at three times the average rate from 2012 to 2023 and truly extraordinary amounts of storage expansion, particularly once VRE gets above 75% um, really of average electricity production nationally. So what are the big issues now? Um, I think, uh, firstly, how to ensure investment of new generation capacity in the context of local opposition to transmission expansion and market prices affected by ever-expanding rooftop solar. Uh, rooftop solar in particular has driven prices down in the middle of the day. Uh, in some states, South Australia, the, the typical price, the median price is zero or close to zero or less than zero from 10 a.m. until about 3 p.m. every day. How do you incentivize investment in that context? And transmission expansion is now a huge issue. There's a great deal of opposition from local communities to 500 kV transmission lines crossing their properties. Um, how to expand storage to accommodate ever greater um, renewable electricity penetration uh, when the energy market arbitrage profits, the gains from discharging less the cost for charging are not big enough yet to bring on the, the volume of storage that's needed. Um, how to synchronize coal generation closure with new clean energy installation and storage expansion, uh, and what role, if any, for zero low emission generation. Uh, this is now becoming a very big debate in Australia. Um, how to find the right balance between behind the meter solar and battery expansion and the shared grid, and how to share the costs between the two. And finally, most importantly, getting demand to be more flexible, in other words, to increase demand when wind and solar is plentiful. Moving on to power system reliability and um, security. Uh, the critical issue is really net load. And I've got a chart here which shows you hourly net load at different measures of the distribution in um, South Australia. So the, the, the light blue line at the bottom is the minimum net load. Net load is the demand on the grid at the transmission system less the dispatch from wind and solar production. So it's, if you like, the demand left to be met by a um, dispatchable resource, uh, which could be fossil fuel, it could be battery or, or hydro. And you can see the minimum was negative in all hours. Wind and solar was completely meeting the state's demand. At the five, uh, at the, the, the fifth lowest values, it was also negative, um, less than zero. At the median, the black, you can see that it was negative at um, hour one o'clock, but pretty close to zero from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. But yet the dotted line you can see is the maximum demand for a um, dispatchable resource. So there's just as much maximum demand for the dispatchable resource. That's largely unchanged. You still need to meet that, that, that maximum in the context in which in so many hours you now have very little demand for a dispatchable resource. So... I'm going to talk about the transmission level actions in South Australia to manage um, high variable and negative net load. So four synchronous um, condensers with flywheels were brought into service in 2021. A voltage support for Adelaide, the capital city in um, South Australia, uh, has a population of a million, just to put it in, in a context for you. 
Um, also, to keep the system running through system frequency constraints in South Australia for system strength, local system strength. And consequently, after having installed the SYNCONS, the minimum synchronous um, generator requirement went from four units to one unit. That four unit was achieved by actually constraining on gas generators that otherwise didn't want to produce because there was plentiful wind and solar. So they managed to get that down to one unit. Uh, now the focus has switched very decidedly to grid forming batteries. Um, and it's now the standard. There are eight under construction, five already are operational, uh, including 300 megawatts, 500 megawatt hours in South Australia and New South Wales. Um, when the interconnector between South Australia and Victoria failed, um, SA power networks on EMO's instruction drove up the network voltage uh, in order to automatically trip off large amounts of solar. Uh, and so in that way, took out a whole lot of uh, variable um, uh, plant and made way for a um, dispatchable resource, a very rough tool to have used, but they managed to keep the system stable and the vast majority of households, at least for those periods, didn't even notice it, but um, clearly unacceptable as a mechanism going forward. Um, uh, what the network operator is now required is centralized control of all inverters for all new um, behind the meter solar installations. Um, quite what that means in practice, no one knows, but it has been set as a standard. Um, there's two resources I'd point you to, uh, our website, vpc.org.au and VNEM uh, interactive data dashboard that allows you to interrogate data at five minute resolution and longer averages uh, to see what's going on in the national electricity market. Back to you, um, Chris. Thank you very much indeed, Bruce. Uh, thank you for sticking to time. <laughs> uh, we're on target and on track. Uh, really interesting presentation, uh, such impressive figures uh, coming out of Australia, such ambitious targets uh, going forward. Uh, definitely some lessons to be learned there. And uh, the critical role being played by, by rooftop solar PV is really remarkable. I've been long saying that uh, that uh, rooftop solar PV at residential and commercial level, you know, is the quickest uh, and lowest hanging fruit uh, in delivering uh, new uh, energy to the to to the grid, uh, and it's proving that uh, in South Africa, uh, and I think uh, it could do a lot more uh, with the kind of incentivization and the kind of aggressive can-do spirit. Uh, that, that Australia uh, has shown. Um, uh, but even despite this uh, rooftop solar PV in South Africa is showing a remarkable growth, uh, driven by load shedding, of course. But I think in due course, the driver is going to shift as load shedding slowly gets dealt with. The driver will shift to pure economic considerations as the price of battery energy storage and solar PV it's still coming down um, and, and there's a way to go. So I uh, really uh, appreciate your input here. And I, I'm uh, now going to uh, uh, you know, move to our next presenter. Uh, and I will introduce to you uh, Dr. Gabrielle Kuyper uh, from the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Uh, Gabrielle, I see you are there. And uh, if you could share your screen, share your uh, presentation, put it onto the opening slide and uh, put into full screen mode while I introduce you. And uh, Gabrielle is an energy sustainability and climate change professional with over 20 years experience in the corporate world, in government and non-government organizations and academia. Uh, Dr. Kaper has held senior executive and senior advisory energy related positions at the Energy Security Board in the office of the Australian Prime Minister. Uh, at the Public Interest Advocacy Center and in the New South Wales government. Uh, Dr. Caper currently works internationally and in Australia on policy and regulation to support distributed energy resources. Uh, that is uh, rooftop solar, electric vehicles, uh, smart appliances, etc. She is a distributed energy resource specialist and a guest contributor with the Institute for uh, Economics and Financial An Analysis. And she's speaking to us today in this role. Over to you, uh, Gabrielle. Thanks so much for having me, Anna. Uh, was music 
to my ears to hear you say that uh, obviously rooftop solar and distributed energy resources are the low hanging fruit because uh, that's exactly what I'm going to be speaking to. It's also fantastic to follow Anton and Bruce. So I will touch on a lot of what they've covered at a high level and hopefully on a couple of points at least dive into a little bit more detail. Um, but also I've seen from the questions the nature of the very well-informed and intelligent audience that's uh, listening to this. So I uh, really look forward to to the fact that we've got lots of time, hopefully, for Q&A in person as well. Uh, you've already seen these ducks before. Uh, these ducks have uh, kind of gone viral, uh, which has been an interesting experience uh, sort of from an analyst perspective. There's nothing like working with a great graphic designer to get, a, get your point across. Uh, but I'll backtrack a little bit and tell you the the thinking behind these ducks and how they came about because it's an important point in terms of I was thinking about the fact that we always forecast forward from the past to look at what future energy systems will look like and we know that the future will be substantially different from the past particularly around DR. So I thought, well, it's worthwhile doing the thought experiment. What happens when you have saturation levels of distributed energy resources in Australia? We know that at some point, every house that can have solar will have solar, um, we'll have all our vehicles will be electric vehicles, we'll have a lot of hopefully flexible appliances, flexible demand. And so where will that leave us in terms of how will the national electricity market operate? What does it mean in terms of flows on the network and the like? And by way of context, the average household system size is now up to 9.5 kilowatts, so uh, which is quite extraordinary. And I looked into it, especially thinking about what we should use as assumptions. And this is only one piece of um, sort of dozens or hundreds really of different iterations that we did in this modeling, or in fact, I should give all credit to a company called ITP Renewables. Um, I came up with the idea, they did all the hard work behind this modeling. Um, and they suggested a system size of 12 kilowatts for this sort of central scenario. And you might think, well, that's enormous and we're not there yet. But the power density of residential model modules for solar has improved 45% in the last four years. So obviously the prices have come down, power densities have gone up. And so households in Australia can afford to put larger and larger systems on their homes. So 12 kilowatts is eminently possible in the near future. So, and the, obviously the pink duck, particularly through the slides that Anton and Bruce showed you is where we're at at the moment. But as we get more batteries, um, then we will obviously move a lot of the solar generated during the day into the evening peak. And then once you can allow those batteries to trade, you will put the duck to sleep. Um, and what's really interesting is obviously the economic consequences of this. So no, not only do you take basically the super profits out of the wholesale market. So the 4 to 8 p.m. peak in Australia, you know, as everywhere is where the vast majority of the revenue has come from traditionally for generators. And that can decrease from this modelling, which was only done for one region of the national electricity market, but decreased it from anywhere between um, 67 and 92%. So that's a really significant but also what's significant is the reduction in peak demand on the distribution grid. And in Australia, 25% uh, of the revenue that's granted to the distribution businesses is meeting peak demand at 40 hours a year. So it's very peaky. Um, it's all air conditioning in summer, basically, through heat waves. And obviously, as Bruce has talked about, there's challenges with that peak not coming down as we get more solar into the system. 
Um, so I'll talk to some of the solutions of that. But wanted to give you the background as to where these sleeping ducks came from. And it's really, um, I think, been very helpful to think backwards from the future um, and to show that this is where inevitably we will get to, but we've got to get the policy and regulation right to get the consumer benefits that could result. Um, and also, particularly for a technical audience, it's important to show uh, there are very nice cartoons, but there's also a lot of hardcore modelling behind this. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, this was done for a client who hasn't made it publicly available, still hoping to do it um, across the entire national electricity market at some point if we can find someone to fund it. Um, and unfortunately, our market operator or any of the market institutions has not done anything equivalent. But um, it's also important to note um, sort of as Bruce has talked to, that we still need the imports from the wider grid. We still need large-scale renewables. Um, we still need some um, level of new transmission debate about how much. Um, the vast majority of Australia has great solar generation potential in winter, except in Victoria, um, where, for example, there's a big emphasis on building offshore wind, um, which will be needed. Uh, but basically, obviously, the solar resource generally in Australia is fantastic, which is one of the reasons we've had such large uptake. So a piece of research I did recently was looking at what might be the economic benefits of distributed energy resources. And so I did a meta-analysis of nine studies that have been done looking at five of the, four of them on different types of DER and the benefits you might get and five of the studies looking at multiple types of DR. And um, the graphic designer and I discussed how we had to get something that was at least as viral as the sleeping duck. And she came up with this nice Swiss Army knife graphic to explain how DR can provide multiple services. Um, so at the moment, obviously, generation is significant, um, storage is significant, Flexible demand, as we get to, is nowhere near as significant as it could be, but it is still used. Um, ancillary services, you can have residential batteries feeding in and VPPs to provide those. Um, there's a little bit of um, our emergency capacity that has been um, provided in the past and can be provided through behind the meter DR. The piece that hasn't really been done significantly but I'll also talk to is the network services piece. However, um, fantastic studies from Beringa and Nera were both done on NPVs to 2040 and if you combine those because there was no overlap that shows you could get a minimum 19 billion dollars in avoided network wholesale and storage costs by 2040 and then it's really nice, uh, the sleeping duck modelling was done a couple of years ago and we've now got a number um, for how much you could re reduce the super profits in that or the super normal profits in that 4 to 8 p.m. peak. And they nearer gave a number of $10 billion there, which is obviously would be significant for consumers' bills. So looked at the saturation levels and then there are some numbers now in terms of the economic benefits of DR. And then obviously, as Anton said, there's a variety of other advantages to DR, particularly the fact that there are basically no social license issues. Um, Australians now love their rooftop solar. Um, we have relatively low levels of EV uptake, but that's just taking off now. People who have EVs love them. Um, so that's sort of the background but getting into what's needed um this is like the world's simplest diagram but i think it's important to talk to the different types of challenges that dr integration provides and they do overlap somewhat um, but there is to my mind a sort of order of priority in terms of you have to do the technical piece first to a large degree in order to enable some of the regulatory and planning changes and then allow for the market participation um, 
you can't have electric vehicles participating in markets till you have vehicle to grid standards and have worked all of that out, for example. So dynamic operating envelopes have already been mentioned. This, um, to my mind, is a really significant innovation developed through South Australian Power Networks. Basically, they've gone from the static 5 kilowatt limits to a variable limit up to 10 kilowatts, which is particularly significant when the average system size being installed is 9.5 kilowatts. So this system allows for a greater consumer return on their investment, but much more importantly, allows for much greatly reduced curtailment of that rooftop solar. Um, now, as Bruce has talked about, there's a lot of challenges with negative prices in the middle of the day. Um, that's not a, a problem for consumers. It's certainly a big challenge for the coal-fired generators that need to keep generating through those negative prices. Um, but dynamic operating envelopes offer the potential to variable export, very exports and also in the future very imports and happy to talk more about this um, but I also noticed there was a question about costs um, this was a trivial amount it was less than one percent of South Australian Power Network's five-year revenue determination to put this in place it's basically you know programmers it's software it's um, a few FTE um, there um, flexibility is also so been mentioned Bruce talked a lot about storage I always now try and talk about flexibility first um, because that's where the real low cost potential is and we're not making the most of it this yet um, Australia could do so much more um, and a really important point there is we've got a lot of like gas hot water systems that need to be electrified University of Technology Sydney did a study showing that fast electrification pathway for domestic hot water could unlock 22 gigawatts of flexible demand. And at the moment, we don't have technical standards which say if you put in a heat pump hot water system, it has to be able to be flexible. So we need to get those things in place. I talked about on the Swiss Army knife, we haven't really unlocked DR participating to provide network services. This is going to be really, really hard um, because we've had the same essentially CPI minus X network revenue regulation since the NIM started. Um, it's quite an ossified kind of system. There's lots and lots of changes around the edges over the last like 20 years. Um, but um, I'm working on a report at the moment looking at how we need a first principles review of this um, and, you know, watch the space. If that ever gets up, I'm hoping Australia can set a precedent here. Um, looking to do two things. One, to talk about the fact that distribution businesses are no longer monopoly infrastructure. So you can provide network services through aggregated DER. Um, and what does that contestability mean? And also, if you make it contestable, how can we make sure that we can get a lower cost of service of distribution network services through that aggregated DER? That won't do everything, but at least some of the services that are required and reducing the expenditure on the infrastructure. Very, very challenging. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will understand the consequences of that. But I wanted to talk very, very briefly just to mention, and it's worthwhile looking um, up the details um, afterwards if you're interested. We have one fascinating project which has looked at real-time network pricing. So sending signals at this stage only to batteries, but about real-time network prices. Um, with the idea that you would have dynamic operating envelopes, but then you could use network pricing to optimize VPP bid, bids. Um, there's, this is very, very early stages. There's a lot of technical challenges, um, including 
internet failure and all the rest. Um, but I think it's a fascinating model. It's not the only model out there, um, but it's very helpful that it's been done to sort of as an example of how you can aggregate DR and also an alternative to the model some people might have heard about out of New York, which is that you need a trading platform to sort of have a kind of mini market at the distribution level. This is just doing it through real-time network pricing. There's a whole report that sets out in great detail six areas of recommendations for energy ministers about what we need to do to make sure we've got great integration. Um, and I really want to emphasise while Australia has really, you know, obviously world-leading levels of rooftop solar, that's got a lot to do with some regulation, some policies, um, and a lot to do with the industry. Our regulatory system is still significantly lagging behind. Um, and I don't want to get give you the impression that we have proactively well planned for any of this. Um, there's a lot of regulatory catch up um, happening. The final thing I wanted just to touch on is what's becoming increasingly important and I think is worthwhile thinking about in terms of the low hanging fruit comment is the resilience benefits of distributed energy resources. This hasn't really been part of any of our conversations from a economic regulation point of view or from a policy point of view. Uh, but as we see climate change get worse and worse and more extreme weather events, the resilience benefits that you get from DR are becoming increasingly obvious. So my favourite anecdote that is this about the city of Newcastle. So they installed a ground-mounted solar farm at their waste treatment plant, aka their garbage drunk dump. And they have now, in the process of buying a series of electric garbage trucks, those garbage trucks will go to the waste treatment plant, dump their garbage, can refuel at the solar farm. And the city of Newcastle has already factored into their investment decision making around these garbage trucks that they will be able to send them out to emergency centres in the advent of a bushfire or a flood and that those garbage trucks will provide emergency power supply in those circumstances. Um, you know, a normal vehicle is a large battery on wheels. Obviously, electric trucks are really, really significantly um, size batteries on wheels and so um, I think it's the perfect example of how you can get co-benefits from DER. And finally in case people are interested from my, from my view Western Power are the furthest ahead in thinking about how to make the most of distributed energy resources to provide lower cost services and a more resilient electricity supply. So what they did was they had a huge network that needed a lot of upgrades, replacement, um, capex spend, and they decided that I think 60% of their network serviced 10% of their customer base, and they decided to replace a lot of their SWIR network with standalone power systems and microgrids. So they are now installing these systems and pulling out the poles and wires, particularly useful in areas where there's bushfire risks. And um, it's an extraordinary example of thinking forward um, into the future. And that fortunately is my last slide, seeing you've come um, on screen, Chris, which tells me that I am out of time. Well, thank you so much, Gabrielle. Uh, you know, what is really remarkable about your presentation is your description of the benefits <laughs> and the opportunities that emerge uh, from this aggressive move uh, to um, uh, renewable energy, to solar PV, and in particular to rooftop solar PV. And, and it's really, you know, interesting and exciting, uh, you know, to to actually look at these benefits. Uh, I mean, you 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 have acknowledged that there are still 
significant areas of further action. That is the can-do spirit. Uh, but there are also uh, a lot of benefits that you've described. Uh, I was uh, really fascinated to hear about Project Edith and uh, also these um, trucks, uh, battery uh, electric op electric trucks, electric vehicles that are going to become dual use. And of course, that's the whole point about an electric vehicle. It is a dual use for transport and other electricity services. Uh, so uh, it makes the business case for uh, electric vehicles, um, whether it's motor vehicles or trucks or taxis or whatever, it, it makes the business case better and better. And you've talked about the resilience benefits, the benefits of the, you know, we often talk about the unreliability or in South Africa, it, there's a sort of narrative about the unreliability of, uh, of solar PV. <laughs> Uh, but you've explained uh, that uh, this distributed energy resources bring resilience benefits and even reduce the expenditure on, on infrastructure. So fascinating to hear what you, you're doing. Now, we're a little bit over time, but before our 10-minute comfort break, I would like to tell you about a fascinating new podcast series on the energy transition in South Africa. Investec Bank is one of our partners today who've made today's webinar possible. And they've recently launched a new podcast series, which is broadcast on Investec Focus Radio South Africa. And it's all about South Africa's energy transition. It's a 10 part podcast series called The Current. And I want to now uh, flight a short uh, video introduction from the show's host, who is the well-known radio and TV presenter, Imam Rapetti. So I'm going to ask our producer, Ian uh, Reid, now uh, to uh, flight this short uh, video. Over to you, Ian. Petty and some of the brightest minds on a 10 episode podcast series where we look at everything you need to know about South Africa's energy transition, the ins and outs of energy, making it, saving it, using it for anyone and everyone that needs to be switched on about our energy landscape. Get it exclusively with Investec Focus Radio, delivered in your ears or inbox. The Current, your live wire on everything energy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, all about uh, The Current. And if you're interested in listening to The Current, which, as I say, is a series of 10 podcasts on South Africa's energy transition, simply follow Investec Focus Radio South Africa where, on wherever you get your podcasts. So I'm now going to share a link uh, on The Current, uh, on the Zoom uh, chat uh, text facility, and I'm also going to share this link in the feedback report to all registrants to this uh, webinar. So if you go to the chat facility, you will see the link uh, that's being shared. Please copy and paste this link and you can listen to this uh, series of 10 uh, podcasts. And uh, so uh, thank you, Ian, for doing the honors and sharing that video. And we'll now take a 10 minute comfort break, or shall we make it an eight minute comfort break? It's 12 minutes past 10 at the moment. Let us reconvene at 20 minutes past 10, uh, 20 minutes past 10, which is an eight minutes time. Uh, and let's have a well-deserved uh, comfort break uh, before we return and listen to two further presentations, excellent presentations now setting the local scene uh, presentation from Ronald Murray at Eskom Transmission uh, and then Slancha and Giri from Salga, uh, you know, who, who, who have a deep understanding of the realities of the South African environment. Uh, and it's important to balance the two, the opportunities uh, in Australia that they've shown us, uh, as well as the realities of South Africa and our unique uh, situation here, as unique as one can make it um, and uh, we look forward to those presentations after the comfort break see you back here at 20 minutes past 10 thank you well ladies and gentlemen it's exactly 10 20 that's 20 minutes past 10 today in johannesburg south africa and uh, we're going to resume the webinar now uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker uh, who is uh, now going to, uh, you know, uh, revert back to South Africa, you might say. Uh, he attended this uh, delegation to Australia that was led by Anton Eberhard, 
and um, we're going to hear from his insights. And it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, to Ronald Marais from Eskom Transmission. So over the last 30 years, Ronald has contributed to the development of the power grid within South and Southern Africa. He started as a trainee technician at GEC Measurements, where he gained experience across a wide range of distribution and transmission protection schemes. Ronald has since had over 25 years service at Eskom, where he currently heads the Transmission Strategy Grid Planning Department. His key focus areas include strategic and long-term grid planning, generation connection capacity assessment, and collaboration on both local and international system development and economics. Within his department, Ronald is responsible uh, for project leadership uh, and financial, commercial, human capital performance and stakeholder relationship management. So I'm now going to uh, call on Ronald to share his presentation uh, and uh, to put it into full screen mode and switch on your microphone, Ronald. And we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, just a correction. I was not on the tour, um, but I asked to contribute some thoughts, uh, which I uh, will do now. Um, so the, the area that I would like to focus on is, uh, you know, what is the concern with high penetration renewables? And I think the concern is, is not about renewables, and it's rather about the increased inverter-based penetration. And the inverter-based penetration uh, on both utility scale and embedded in rooftops is where uh, the concern lies. Uh, inverters are highly controlled devices, uh, and they do exactly what they're told to do. Um, but if they, this requires that these controllers need to be tuned, they need to be told what to do. And the, the tuning of, of the devices depends on the conditions in which they are tuned in. So the greater the penetration, the higher the interaction between these inverters become. So the conditions at which we are integrating the inverters now suddenly have changing conditions over the period of which they're installed. And you have multiple generations of inverters on the grid. Um, and this, this um, interaction between the grid and the inverters and the inverters themselves, as the grid changes its conditions, has different consequences on, on the behavior of the, of the grid. And this is where the concern lies. So the interaction needs to be examined. And the interaction uh, often that we speak about is under normal conditions when uh, all is going well. But the, the system needs to be able to be resilient under uh, multiple events and also these days extreme events. Um, and under these conditions, we need to make sure that the grid will remain stable under these conditions. So one of the areas is that we really need to examine this behavior of, 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 the, of the inverters. And the, the system behavior um, is really predicted through models. And the testing of this interaction uh, cannot be conducted at commissioning stage or close to commissioning stage, but rather it needs to be done at a much earlier stage to make sure that not only the um, plant that's been commissioned is going to be stable, but also all the additional plant with multiple generations of types of plant and variations actually remain stable in the conditions um, that they were originally tuned in. And remember that most of the inverters that are put into the system are, are grid following inverters. And what that means is that the, you need a grid to follow. So, so the grid's quality of being able to follow is impaired as we reduce the synchronous system um, or synchronous plant of the system. And this needs to be addressed. And the way in which the response of these inverters respond to this become really important. So there needs to be an appreciation that uh, with greater integration of uh, inverter-based uh, systems, you need much higher quality of modeling. You need greater upfront assessment. You need increased ability to tune these devices to a much higher degree and you need, in order to do this, you need common platforms and common integration points. Um, and and this, is not a, a, this is not a barrier for renewable plant, but it's rather an essential requirement for 
for grids and inverters to remain stable. And so it's, it's important that it gets appreciated that um, there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done as we get higher penetrations to um, make sure that at the application stage and at the integration of these plant that uh, all of these factors are taken into consideration. Not only that, but it's critical that the monitoring of these plant, when they're physically put into the grid, are validated. Models are just models, and the way they actually inter interact with the grid and interact under different conditions, you can't model every single condition that the network is going to experience. So you, you need to monitor the behavior of these um, plant to make sure that if there is any interaction on the grid, that you can identify and rectify this as fast as possible. Now, um, so we, we had to talk about Australia. And so let's have a look what Australia, they recognize these as critical issues. And the AMEO have put into uh, place very stringent modeling requirements. These modeling requirements require high quality testing of the models. Uh, these tests on the models itself could take up to a year. They insist on common platforms. They insist on um, very high fidelity um, uh, modeling in RMS and EMT. Well, these are just different levels of modeling that require much more sophisticated knowledge of how that plant is going to behave. And in order to do these tests, they require a significant range of tests to be done on the models before they accept them to be put on their system. Those tests and the details of the modeling often require that um, the, uh, the, the plant being connected will require to make sure their models are appropriately um, provided and this might increase some of the costs. So it, it, is, it, it, it needs to be recognized that modeling of the system to make sure that we understand these interactions will require significantly enhanced uh, capabilities and modeling requirements in the grid as recognized in Australia. Also, what is recognized in Australia is that these inverters, as the system becomes weaker and weaker, with uh, the, the grid itself cannot form uh, the characteristics that the inverters can follow. And this weakening of the grid needs to be addressed. And so, and part of the addressing of this is that the plant itself that is going to be commissioned in that area has the ability to address some of these issues themselves. And understanding the weakness of the grid, the interaction of the grid um, allows them then to adapt their integration to, um, to mitigate some of these conditions but also that the system itself needs to have characteristics that can provide the inverters with a stable system to be able to follow. So there are multiple different requirements now that uh, with the reduction of the synchronous plant that you need to have these capabilities brought into the system. And the behavior again is, uh, is only tested once we can have a look at the interaction of the, of the, the, the greater details of these models within in the area. So these become, uh, I would say, constraints that with higher penetration, there's a higher responsibility to integrate each other's uh, models and plans to see how they interact with each other, to be able to assess what the, what the issues are, and then to see how to address those issues. And then another key um, development in Australia, and they were one of the first to do this, there are a couple of other uh, utilities that are that have got this facility, um, but the Australian one is um, a, a leader in the world with this. They have a detailed connection simulation model. So these detailed models that are required integrate into the grid, and because the plant interacts with the um, with the neighbouring plant, and because those conditions need to be tuned to make sure that not only your plant is stable, but that you aren't causing your neighboring plants to go unstable. They have a tool that integrates all of these um, uh, sensitive models, uh, intellectual property models, uh, but still allows the, uh, uh, the plant who wants to connect 
to be able to simulate and tune their models to greater details. And these simulation models become critical to make sure that the overall behavior of the system remains intact. So there's an, in, there is an integration of uh, common use of the system, common tools and uh, requirements that as you go to high and higher penetrations, these requirements become a must. And they not, should not be seen as an impediment that is trying to block renewables, but it's trying to make sure that the inverters that the renewables use remain stable on the grid. And this will require that greater modeling capability and cooperation between manufacturers, utilities, and service providers to integrate these systems uh, um, are, are found. And I think Australia has found that balance, but they have one of the most stringent application uh, connection processes that are, are, are there for good reason, because they are pursuing this. And I think this is one of the, the areas is that when these are, requ are required, um, the industry needs to, um, need to participate in this so that we can get higher penetrations with certainty of greater stability within the area. And we mustn't undermine what South Africa has achieved as well. Um, in, the, in the Northern Cape, uh, which is a very high penetration area, um, the, the local load there uh, in 2022, we've, for every month in the year, there is, no, there is no conventional plant, no coal, no gas, no hydro, no pump storage. It's just pure renewables, uh, PV, wind, and CSP. And for the entire um, year of 2022, we've run uh, um, renewable energy greater than the local uh, energy requirements for every single month for the entire year. And we're still connecting more renewables within those areas. We've exceeded the local um, capacity by about 160% to the local energy requirements. And we export that during the daytime uh, over about 900 kilometers to the nearest load center. And at nighttime when the, uh, uh, when the solar resources aren't there, it is supplemented for the, for the nighttime load. But overall on a monthly basis, we see a um, net 100% a, a uh, renewable energy uh, consumption uh, uh, in terms of the generation to, to local load uh, requirements. I also think um, that it's important to, when we talk about this resilience uh, in Australia with bushfires and so forth, uh, you know, there's incidents where um, you do have smoke that covers large portions of the area and places the reliance on, uh, on pure solar resources at risk. So, so the challenges they're having with interconnectors is a challenge. Um, if, the, you know, if cloud cover uh, lasts for, for longer or, or than, than required, you, you need to have this interconnected relationship to balance these risks within the system. And batteries on their own are, are limited in capacity for these long duration periods and you really rely on additional either renewable resources from other places that are not experiencing this constraint, but you need a highly interconnected uh, transmission grid to mitigate all of these uh, reliable re reliability issues. So the observations and conclusions just that I want to focus on in this particular um, area, because there are lots of nuances in the system um, uh, people often speak about uh, inertia and, and these problems, but before you get to those system problems, there's about five different dimensions of issues that need to be addressed. But all of them come back to how we model the details of these plant, the compliance requirements to the grid codes, and the enhancements in the grid code that need to be um, uh, adapted to the changing environments with higher penetration uh, renewables. So to have successful integration of higher penetration into the grid, we really require increased modeling details and tuning. The better the tuning, the better the models, the greater the ability to um, ensure that the network uh, will um, end up in a stable condition. To date, there's been challenges in the large, in the large bust ups like uh, we've seen, um, uh, um, in uh, Brazil and other places, 
Um, the modeling has been a challenge to replicate the event. So there is an increased enhanced requirement that we can trust the futures through the modeling, uh, through, through improved models. And these barriers should not be seen as renewable barriers that are trying to be put in place, but they are really essential requirements to ensure that we have stability in the inverters. And, and these will be, have to be enhanced for uh, rooftops and so forth, because as their penetration increases, we depend more and more on their ability to remain stable under different system conditions. And to, you know, to address these issues, to find out more, we really need to increase the discussions and to have better understanding of these constraints. We shouldn't, we shouldn't worry about talking about problems with these things. We should try and understand the problems through discussion and uh, try and explore by understanding the problems, we'll understand how to find the solutions. Uh, so we shouldn't see the discussions of uh, um, um, can do um, as to let's understand the problems. I think it's really important to understand the real issues. A lot of the modeling that we are doing still has many questions of whether the modeling itself and the testing, um, which is dominantly done by synchronous um, historical uh, procedures and processes, are fully appropriate for inverter base. So there's a lot of discovery still to take place, um, and this can only be done through through questioning. So increased model validation and tuning uh, will require significant focus from everybody in the industry. Um, the, you know, we shouldn't resist this. We should embrace this, and we should participate to make sure that uh, we we can have greater penetration through to to greater certainty and higher quality of, of of these requirements. But we also need to take uh, recognition that the, these plants are going to be in the system for 20 years, if not longer. And you will have multiple generations of these plants. Um, and these generations of plant will be tuned and they will have different historical capabilities. And all of these need to be uh, uh, in the same community on the grid. And the ability to manage this uh, diversity on the grid uh, needs uh, needs consideration. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a piece of uh, technical kit that's ten years old cannot perform as a new piece of kit can work. And we we need to recognise these limitations and see how to work around them. And this requires that um, many of the functionalities in the grid code, um, which often lag what the inverters can do. Um, and lag what uh, the requirements of the grid uh, um, it needs, needs to be updated. So, so we need to continuously look at uh, updating the grid codes to enhance the requirements to make sure that we get the full capabilities out of the inverters and make sure that the collaboration and integration um, is done to ensure uh, grid stability. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, very much to Ronald for those insights and for really bringing us down to earth, shall we say, uh, making sure that we understand the challenges. And that is not to, um, you know, to put hurdles in the way of renewable energy, but uh, actually to understand the issues, uh, to overcome them, and actually to enhance uh, the renewable penetration. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, that this is going to be a very, very exciting time for engineers. Uh, and um, he's talked about the changing conditions that really require retuning, and that implies uh, inverters that are really smart, smart inverters, smart batteries that can communicate. And the role of the of the uh, uh, information and communication technologies, ICT, uh, in in the um, uh, smoother operating of the grid uh, and the integration of these uh, different devices. Uh, Ronald has talked about uh, the very stringent processes that are need, needed to ensure uh, system integrity uh, going forward. Uh, he's also talked about, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, we're going to have to learn how to cope with a, a very widely different um, a generation of and batteries that are installed on the grid uh, not of all, not all of them are smart enough. Uh, but what we do need to make sure is that the new inverters that go into the grid are indeed smart enough going forward. And we need standards. We need to update to the grid code, and uh, and we can see what can be done. In the Northern Cape, he pointed to 
the fact that they have excess renewable in, uh, energy in every single month of the year, uh, and we have learned how to cope with that. Uh, and I have no doubt that with the passage of time, with the learning and uh, you know the experiences of other countries, uh, uh, such as Australia and other jurisdictions, we're going to uh, learn how to cope uh, with these situations uh, going forward, uh, coming from where we are. Uh, so it's I think it was a very positive talk uh, by by Ronald and Ronald, thank you for that. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our last presenter, uh, who is Nchlantra Ngidi. And Nchlantra is currently the head of energy and electricity at SALGA, which is the South African Local Government Association. And he has got over 20 years of work experience, including at the National Energy Regulator of South Africa, that is NERSA, uh, within local government utilities and within ESKIM itself. Currently, he plays a pivotal role advocating for policy reforms enabling municipalities to embrace the energy transition and to achieve smart and sustainable energy business models. Nshlantla holds a master's degree in business leadership, an MBL degree. Uh, he has a postgraduate degree in the management, uh, in management development, and he has a Bachelor of Technology degree in electrical engineering and a national diploma in power engineering. He's a registered engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa, a member of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, and an alumni of the U.S. International Leadership Program. Great privilege to have you here uh, in Tlantia. I've known you for many years, and um, uh, it's really exciting to hear about the role that uh, that, that you and Selga are playing in embracing this energy transition. So if I can ask you please to share your uh, presentation at this point uh, and uh, put it in full screen mode, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, we can see your presentation. Uh, it's uh, if you can put it into full screen mode by clicking that button. Uh, and uh, yes, you're now in full screen mode, and we can see it perfectly. Over to you, uh, Inshlantla. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, uh, for having me, and uh, good morning to the delegates in the meeting and fellow uh, panelists. Um, you know, it's always a disadvantage to be the last because everyone has pretty much said everything that you're planning to say, but um, I'm going to talk about the perspective of municipalities, um, especially based on the lessons that we learned uh, in the study tour uh, to Australia. So we already had positions around how we see the municipalities play in the market space uh, in the future. Uh, but I think after you know the, the study tour uh, to Australia, there's a lot of rich information that came through which enabled us to also put, you know, a lot of nuances in, in our positions that we have and, and basically how we view the, the participation of municipalities uh, going into the future. Um, I'm going to, because uh, I know my passion of the sector can get the better of me and I'll talk on and on without stopping. So I'm going to try to move quite swiftly because I have 15 minutes um, so I, I thought it would be, um, you know, great to actually start with an introduction on what is the status in municipalities on, on a better generation. I think as Salka, what we do every year, we try to collect all the data and information uh, on embedded generation in municipalities, because we see that as very critical in terms of, um, you know, knowing the status of, of embedded generation in municipalities, so that we know um, you know, who is, um, you know, um, has these installations uh, in their systems and who is feeding back into the grid for safety and, and in other reasons and also make it to make sure that when municipalities are preparing themselves to play in the market space through um, DRs or distributed uh, energy resources, it's easy for them to actually aggregate because they know uh, that everyone, they know everyone who's in the system and has Register their, um, you know, embedded generation. So, said so there has been a massive increase in installation uh, of this uh, generation, um, embedded generation, and uh, we think that um, I think in the beginning, some years ago, there was some sort of, you know, uneasiness from municipalities around, uh, you know, the proliferation of embedded generation. But I think now we've uh, with you know, the opportunity is being unpacked of this embedded generation. The municipalities uh, understand that this is a reality they have to adjust to. They have to take opportunities for that and, and make sure that uh, 
you know, they review their business models to align to the current transitions that we are going through. So we have a cooperation with GIZ, and as a result, we were part of the study tour and truly appreciate the study tour from GIZ and also uh, Professor, um, you know, Bruce, uh, who is also part of the panelists here, was with us the entire, um, you know, study tour, taking us in and out and throughout all the stakeholders in the Australian energy market. So um, as part of these corporations, we've done a lot of uh, you know, capacity buildings to municipalities, uh, which includes also guidelines, you know, trying to build guidelines for them that can, they can use as their bylaws on how to, you know, to um, manage and register uh, embedded generation, how to control it, how to price embedded generation uh, that is uh, being feedback into the system. Um, and, and also we still need to further capacitate municipalities on how to use these distributed uh, energy resources as a form of participating in the future markets. Because right now, everything is fragmented. Um, there are customers who are still registering. And, you know, there are customers who are really uneasy about registering because they feel, I think there's that feeling that, um, you know, if I register my system, uh, the how the municipalities or distributors would want to deal with my system would be a little a little um, invasive, uh, which is not the case, and that's why we need customers to be uh, well informed uh, about the 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 benefits of registering um, embedded generation. So, if you look at you know in the, the latest uh, embedded generation in the country, and that is just a household. Um, so. We are sitting at about 658 megawatts. And I, I can tell you now, I don't believe this is true. I know there's a lot of customers who are not registering their systems and they are not uh, providing the data to municipalities. And as a result, um, you know, my statements around, we have to teach the, uh, you know, the customers uh, so that uh, or educate them so that they understand, you know, the importance of uh, registering their systems, the safety issues around it, and even their benefits, especially when we're going towards, um, you know, participating in the markets. As you can see the picture there in, in the Houteng province, which is where we're sitting right now, there's quite a lot um, that is, uh, you know, um, it's, 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 it has been installed about 283 megawatts. Um, this slide, I won't uh, take a lot of time on it because it's just giving the numbers uh, from 2020, how they've been increasing. Um, they've, they've been increasing quite exponentially, but I still do think that, uh, you know, uh, the embedded generation that we have in this report that we collect every year, Salka, is nowhere near the, the real embedded generation that is out there in the system. So if you look at the total installed capacity of the megawatt for different types of customers, as you can see, we have over 600 for residential, which is what I was um, you know, presenting in the previous two slides. And for commercial and industrial customers, you have uh, about 1.2 gigawatts. And uh, for commercial and industrial, and industrial scale customers, uh, almost two gigawatts. And uh, the utility scale, which is about 50 megawatts, we have uh, almost two uh, gigawatts there. Um, I, I have to say also, um, um, colleagues, you know, in our discussion with the ESCOM system operator, I, and I'm going to say this carefully because I'm sure there might be media here as well. Allegedly, there is about two gigawatts of solar power that is seen by the system, the system operator, but it's not known where it comes from about two gigawatts. I mean, two gigawatts is two stages of load shedding. So basically we might have these installations that are not registered feeding back into the system, um, helping maybe load shedding, but illegally so because they are not registered into the system. Uh, no one knows where it comes from. It appears uh, for a couple of hours and then it goes away again. So the importance of registration is quite critical. And that's why also, I think we're working with NASA now to ensure that the registration process is in place and also maybe as part of, you know, educating customers to make sure that there is that campaign around, you know, everyone and all the customers, um, you know, um, registering their systems uh, uh, to the authorities. So, 
this is just a, you know, a, a reflection of what I've, uh, of what I've presented, uh, that we have to raise awareness to the customers. Uh, we have to implement user-friendly processes because also that can chase away customers if we ask for too much. Um, reducing the costs uh, incurred by customers uh, to have complaint systems and also to, uh, to support municipalities' capacity to process this registrations and, and and also to incentivize registration by uh, you know providing reasonable export credits so i think that's that's more of a trump card that we can use to get the customers to um you know um, uh, register their, their systems because at this point in time they have a feeling that once they register we are actually going to start you know costing them these fixed charges that are exorbitant just because they have these systems on their or, or in their homes, but we have to make sure that we are very clear in 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 in, in communicating some of the benefits and the importance of having this generation that is out there, uh, you know, that is distributed to have it uh, visible in the system as well. So, just to quickly talk about the the recent uh, policy shifts and um, in the um, in responding to the energy crisis. Um, obviously, recently the the there's hundred percent megawatt embedded um, gener generation, which is not um, uh, the, which does not need to be licensed anymore. It can only be registered, and that obviously has uh, spiked up the number of uh, the application that NASA is sitting with. I'm hearing that uh, NASA is sitting with over four gigawatts of application for embedded generation that they have to process and and register. Um, well, obviously, there the were new generation regulations that uh, allowed municipalities to now can procure generation from other players, which also is is more of a paving the way for municipalities to be able to procure and use some of the distributed energy resources for the purposes of uh, you know uh, participating in the market. Um, wheeling has been prevalent, and and that's why. Uh, on the National Energy Crisis Committees, we have uh, developed and a draft uh, a framework which is now submitted to NASA for NASA to um, consider in their um, the governance processes and approve as, as, as quickly as possible. Because here yeah, there is also a hindrance to um, increasing embedded generation that is in the system if we don't have a clear willing framework. Um, NASA has recently licensed the National Transmission Company that's in preparation for uh, the market. And, and also there's a bill uh, that is introducing the independent system and market operator and other role players in the markets and, and uh, their participation, including um, in the roles that they'll play in the market. Uh, obviously, for energy crisis, for energy um, crisis, uh, there's a creation of uh, national energy crisis committees and its work streams. There are about eleven work, um, uh, work streams uh, under NICOM, which are dealing with various subjects, and that includes also reform of the industry as well, um, including the the, the 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 entire value chain of the industry as well as the general distribution uh, industry as well. So. I'm not going to, I think I'm going to assume that everyone understands and know uh, what the bill is talking about. I'm going to just elevate a few things around uh, what the bill says. It talks about the establishment uh, of the, uh, you know, a competitive market structure, which are going to accommodate market transactions, bilateral transactions, and also regulated uh, you know, transactions as well. Um, it also allocates some responsibilities to the market operator, as well as the transmission uh, company that has been recently um, uh, licensed by NASA. So the relevance for municipalities on this, on this uh, grid, I mean, on this um, uh, en um, era, era amendment bill, uh, obviously the, the, there is the competitive multi-markets, which will consist of generators, traders and network services providers and also the retailers as well. There's, there's market operator, there's gonna be a market operator and the central uh, purchasing agency. And the, the bill is actually unpacking all of those uh, uh, stakeholders that will be in, in, in participating in the market, including their roles as well. Um, 
Also, I think they have already talked to the transmission system operator, which has been recently um, um, licensed. So what is notable for municipalities in the bill, obviously the bill, it has no mention of municipalities, which makes us, um, which creates a little bit of a challenge for us, because whatever positions that we are developing um, or preparing ourselves for the market for uh, are under the assumption based on what we see in Australia and other markets on how the distributors participate in the market and you know um, what 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 are their critical roles in the markets as well. So I, I think we we in our comments that we've made in the bill we we've sort of um, elevated that we need to um, you know we need clarity around what would be the role of uh, distributors um, in the in the in, in, in the new market. And uh, we need to understand also, um, you know, are we going to be allowing municipalities to participate in the market in their current form, or are we going to rearrange the distribution sector as it is so that we don't have a fragmented market as well? And we have different sizes of municipalities and distributors, and some of them are challenged. And so we have to find a, a, a very um, intentional approach on how do we rearrange the sector to ensure that uh, even the distributors themselves are part of the, um, the, the market, uh, you know, um, without also having a lot, a lot of challenges that um, currently are uh, haunting us as the distribution sector, um, which we tried to resolve through the Reds over 20 years ago. And um, that's never saw the, the, the light of day. So uh, looking at the overview of the, you know, the the ESCOM transition uh, transmission market design proposal. Um, I'm not going to go through this picture; it's quite busy, but I think um, it's 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 it talks of a competitive wholesale market, uh, which will consist of generators, retailers, traders, suppliers, customers, network services providers, and uh, at the transmission and distribution level. Um, and basically, that for us, it's already. Um, indicates where could be the role of municipalities here. And that's why I pulled that the, 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 the possible role of municipalities would be to trade with the market operator as a generator or network services provider as, as well as the, uh, the retailer. So we have identified in our research three phases towards you know, uh, developing a full energy market. Um, these are the present day to introduction of markets, the transition, period following introduction of the market and also the complete uh, market uh, imp implementation. So some of the lessons that we take from Australia uh, st uh, study tour as well, um, is that municipalities need to, you know, should assess their strategic uh, options to procure, um, you know, in these distinct phases of, um, you know, towards uh, having the market. And, and, and also with each passing phase, municipal, municipalities will have a greater procurement flexibility, leading to more opportunities for cost reductions in acquiring uh, wholesale energy. And also this will bring a lot of complexities also that could have detrimental effects on the financial standing of municipalities if not carefully considered. Um, also another prevalent, uh, you know, business case, uh, as we learn from the Australian um, market, is the business case of network services, municipalities and ESCOM, um, they don't need to do much. They already own networks. So um, at the, basically here is to ensure that their networks work uh, properly, they are efficient and they are reliable also. And, and that also obviously their network can be used as a collateral to um, register to participate in the market. And also the business case for retail, obviously, it's maybe prevalent to municipalities. We have identified that it's, uh, you know, what you call customer services in municipalities or as for now could actually be, um, you know, and ring fence as, as a separate business that could be um, introducing new, um, um, you know, roles of, uh, you know, playing them in the wholesale market space, being a retailer, buying, and then also selling to the end customer. Um, I think all the presenters that have presented earlier before me, they have raised the issue of control of these distributed resources, and I cannot stress that enough. And um, the Australian grid operators, they demonstrated quite, that quite well. 
uh, we need to build capacity and the infrastructure for control of these distributed resources uh, in municipalities. Uh, you know, in Australia, it was very, um, you know, exciting to see how the grid operators can actually control distributed energy resources to, uh, you know, up to the level of an end customer, like an end customer like us, you know, not the commercial or in this industrial customer, the end customer or, or the household where you, you have maybe your eight kilowatt system, they, uh, they can actually... Um, you know, with the registration of the customer and the customer sharing all the data that needs to be shared with the grid operator, the, the grid operator can actually um, um, log into the inverters uh, in the, of the household uh, if they need to control, uh, you know, that kind of generation. It might be maybe there's a need for voltage support, reactive power support, or even frequency support, or if they need to reduce the generation, they can actually do that, which is something that the assisting operator should be doing uh, with that two gigawatts that they are actually currently seeing, but they don't know where it comes from. So you need they, you need to make sure that you incentivize customers to actually, you know, want to register their systems because uh, I mean there's a lot of opportunities for that. Even these customers can actually participate in the market and uh, you know uh, you know um, have some a lot of benefits around that, um, you know, you could find yourself also paying zero as uh, rents uh, at the end of the day, if uh, you had a good month in terms of the weather or choosing into the system. I think what I see also in the Australian system is uh, unlike here in South Africa, the, I think uh, household generation is not necessarily kept in terms of the, 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 the size that you can install, but obviously you don't have to install uh, double what your house is 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 going to uh, to consume, but I, I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, limited. So yeah, it's it's quite ex exciting. So um, in terms of the phase one, and I'm going to go through this quickly. The phase one of uh, uh, you know the the uh, sorry the transition towards the market. Um, where there's a formal introduction of a wholesale market. So you see, uh, let me just uh, do the point. Uh, okay, so you, as you can see here, there's going to be the transmission company, the, the, the market operator, and then uh, distributors and retailers. Um, and then uh, there is going to be opportunities to play in the market space using distributed energy resources and also to directly secure long-term uh, um, contracts or own uh, uh, your own assets as a municipality or even procure and play in the market space or for phase one obviously the street could could be a lot of business as usual which is you know buying from escom and selling to the customer so that business uh, um, model will not disappear uh, quite quickly especially on the first phase of the um, the, 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 the introduction of the market. So the municipalities can adopt all three options or choose to have a, um, um, a hybrid where they play in the market space and still keep also the service, the, you know, the supply agreements they have with ESCOM as well. So in terms of option two, um, so still here at market operator and, trans and transmission operator, still the same. Um, so the, the municipalities here can use their energy distributed energy resources, and there's a, and then that's why there's a need to aggregate that embedded generation that is currently in the system. So because you have to uh, be able to uh, use that control that to be in the market space, and also directly securing long long term uh, generation capacity outside the market platform, uh, and also procuring for wholesale requirements to be. The market reform. So you still have those three options uh, also during the phase two of the transition. Uh, and then on the phase three of the transition, where you have now the full implementation of the wholesale market. So here the municipalities uh, can also adopt all three options that I've already talked about. Select option three, which is now uh, is going to be procuring for requirements through the market platform. So now you can see here that there is no longer that bulk supply, that's uh, 
business model of bulk supply from ESCOM and selling to the customer is going to be replaced by the procurement for uh, the requirements through the market platform. So that's here, the municipality could be procuring from the IPP, uh, the independent, independent property users, or even for having bilateral with ESCOM as well. So, so there's a lot of opportunities uh, for municipalities getting into the market space. And uh, I think these positions that I'm I'm presenting are positions that we have nuanced based on what we we, we learned from the uh, Australia uh, market and its architecture as well. It's what what was quite helpful, and we, we became more clear on what could be the role of municipalities. And some of the takeaways from you know these uh, distributors. Um, irrespective of the market design, you have to make sure that you separate your, your wireless business from the retail. Uh, you have to make sure that um, your, 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 your wireless business uh, or your, your network is reliable. And, and also municipalities would need to require a license for their network business and also their retail business. Uh, the, the network business obviously will remain a fully regulated business. And I think I'm going to take from the words of uh, Professor uh, Bruce, you know, the, the network re, re, the, the network um, services, uh, you know, business model uh, into the market is one of the most, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say easiest, but it's one of the models that have less headaches because the municipalities and even ESCOM, what we'll be doing here is basically providing those network services and just, um, you know, um, um, using a tariff with a rate of return uh, with a reasonable um, um, uh, profit. So, so basically, yeah, you're not responsible for any customers. You're just responsible for making sure that your grid is available, it's 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 it's, uh, it's reliable, and it's, it's ensuring that the power gets to where it needs to get, and you make your money. So it's less headache here uh, than actually, you know being connected directly with customers and expecting, giving these customers and expecting them to pay. And we know the situation or the environment in, in South Africa right now, where we have quite high uh, non-payment rates and theft of electricity. So that becomes a bit of a, you know, a thorny issue, especially if you're going to adopt a model of being a retailer. And that begs the question also, of maybe we need to legalize these illegal connections and find a way to actually incentivize these customers through solar uh, systems to make sure that maybe we move them out of the grid, but still give them sustainable uh, you know, energy packages so that we reduce this uh, electricity theft and I call it legalizing uh, the, the, the illegal connection by providing the customers sustainable energy packages as well. So, I'm going to move quickly. I know my time is almost over. So now, can I ask you to, to wrap up uh, now, uh, in so we, we really, we're going to share your slides anyway. Yes. Uh, so do not worry if there's still more slides. They will be shared with everybody, but we just have to uh, deal with the Q&A uh, and yes. we're running out of time. Yes, I think I've, I've, I've mostly emphasized what could be the role of municipalities and the opportunities going into the future. So I'm not, I think... Here I was just making examples. When you want to be a successful network uh, services provider, some of the things that you must make sure that you are on top of your game on. So these are some of the things. And also uh, playing in the DER space, these are some of the business models that municipalities could actually uh, adopt and uh, you know towards preparing to play into the market space. Uh, so this, I'm not going to go through it. It's more around the utility management and how um, what are the phases of, or what are the phases and the stages of uh, being a retailer and being a network uh, wires business uh, playing in the market space? Um, this year also is just I'm highlighting that while we are going towards the, the market, the energy market, we might wanna have a look at uh, you know how we rearrange distribution. As I said earlier in my introduction, rearrange distribution such that we have maybe stronger utilities that play in the market space. It could be through consolidation or any other kinds of contracting that could take place at that space to make sure that we have utilities that are stronger that can participate in the market. Obviously, you know, we're not going to um, um, have um, all municipalities playing in the market space. We might have a situation of what is called passive 
uh, you know, participants in the market, which would be those municipalities that don't have the muscle that they could still uh, opt for continuing with the you know, ESCOM bulk purchase model. So that is something that might be with us for a long time as well. So this is just a, you know, very uh, complicated picture about how you see the full market in operation. And uh, I think one of the things I'm gonna say in the in our key, key agent interventions that I needed is, is the policy position on the future of the distribution itself. Uh, because right now we, we are, we are we are uh, we are we we are preparing ourselves for playing in the market space, but we have the legacy challenges that have not been resolved that could be resolved by uh, certain uh, reforms in the structure of the distribution itself. So I'm going to end it there, uh, Chairperson, and thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, back to you, thank Chris. You. Yeah, thank you so much, Shlancha. There is so much to say about this electricity industry. You've highlighted uh, the Electricity Regulation Act, which really is setting the framework for the electricity market development, for the uh, creation of a competitive and diversified generation sector, uh, for the establishment of an independent transmission grid operator and an independent market operator. It's all happening as we speak. Uh, it is absolutely critical uh, if uh, we're going to uh, reform this uh, electricity supply industry to generate an effectively operating and efficient uh, electricity sector. Uh, you've touched on so many issues. I'm sorry we don't have more time. But right now, uh, we're going to move to the q and uh, And I want to uh, firstly say uh, that I'm very grateful to all our presenters who have answered so many of the questions already on the text facility, making it easier for Christine Juter to handle the Q&A at some very high level uh, issues. Uh, she's going to consolidate some of the major issues uh, and present them to the various uh, presenters. Please kind of ask all presenters to switch on your cameras and microphones. Uh, Christine uh, Juta, who's the facilitator for this, is a PhD candidate at the Power Futures Lab at the, UST, at the UCT Graduate School of Business. Her research focuses on the role of new business models and enabling technology for power sector reform in Africa. She focuses on market design, system operation, and regulation. Christine has participated in the Open uh, Africa Power and Inatrax Fellowships, uh, which provides a holistic overview of the electricity sector, enhancing the technical, regulatory, and business skills required to work towards the electrification of Africa. Christine has handled the previous Q&A session so effectively uh, on our webinars that I really am delighted to have her back again. Uh, I'm going to now hand over to you, Christine, to do your do the your uh, honors and uh, handle the Q and A as effectively as you have always done in the past. Over to you. Can Thank you switch you on your much. microphone and camera, Christine? Okay, thank you. thank you very much, Chris, and thank you to the panelists for the very uh, insightful presentations and also for the active audience who have been providing questions in the Q&A, uh, which, as Chris said, uh, makes for an, um, an, an, an interesting uh, background as we begin to have this more um, interactive session. Uh, we did have several questions that have already been answered, but some of them I might pick out questions where I think we could have further discussion on those. And some questions have been directed to specific panelists, uh, but others are more are more uh, general. So uh, you're welcome to also jump in. I think perhaps what I can do is um, first we can look at the implications around market design and uh, price signals. There were several questions in the Q&A which spoke to that. Specifically, there was a question uh, from Penelope for Bruce, uh, which was just asking around what is the, given the increasing share of VRE resources, how should market design evolve to produce more appropriate pricing signals for both generation and demand side flexibility? There was a bit of exchange there around how in one region you have higher pricing than the other. Perhaps maybe Bruce, you could speak more to that and what could be solutions. Okay, uh, it's a it's a very good question. And um, I think the answer is uh, no one really knows how markets with zero marginal cost at the margin can provide adequate revenue for investment. Um, those markets are not unique. We have them in telecoms and data, and it's packaged up as a fixed price service to customers. But electricity has some intrinsic differences to that. Um, these are challenges that are very topical in Australia now, 
we're having many periods where, as I showed, the market clearing price, the five minute price is negative or zero. And whether it's negative or zero, much less than the average cost of production of new wind and solar, how do you attract the investment? The way it's being dealt with practically in Australia is government is stepping in to orchestrate contracts at much closer to average cost. And the question then be, well, how that's passed back to the customer. Um, you will be dealing with exactly the same issues, whether it's a short run marginal cost issue or driving new supply. Um, I think the answer is contracted production from customers like shopping centers who can afford the supply and orchestrate it and have customers that are willing to be uh, or, or, or are keen to have a green association. They'll do some, but government has to do the rest and then figure out how to pass it back. That doesn't mean that markets aren't useful. Markets through short-term prices can signal scarcity and are very useful in signaling the value of storage. So um, we don't have it worked out at all by any manner of means. Frankly, no one does. Um, but I can give you some indication of how we are attempting to deal with it here. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I guess related to that would be uh, around uh, significant criticism for uh, variable renewables has been that um, the cost can be uh, can be perceived to be misleading if we're not really looking at the overall cost of providing other services that are associated with the variability of renewables. Uh, and as the, the, their penetration increases, the costs associated with um, ancillary services and maybe grid reinforcement are increasing. Uh, what has been your experience in Australia and what uh, or what, what what do your models show uh, with your renewable penetration targets? This question was directed to Gabrielle. I know you did uh, respond a bit, but you highlighted that you might want to speak to it further. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, Bruce has sort of touched on this a little bit. The fundamentals are obviously that the generation cost is continuing to fall. So Martin Green, who's like the godfather or the grandfather of solar technology in Australia, is predicting cost to go to install cost to go to 30 cents um, per kilowatt. Um, into the future. And we've just seen solar continue to come down and down the cost curve. I think how much the remaining costs, so that sort of deals with the generation pit, and then there's all the other costs. Um, a lot will come down to how smart we get about our network regulation, uh, but also, and the, obviously the storage piece, but also uh, the big challenge, I think, is the flexible demand piece and how we get the cost shifting right Um as I indicated, domestic hot water would be hugely beneficial if we could shift all of that into the middle of the day. Uh, there's currently every incentive for the retailers that also own a large amount of generation to do that, but you've got a really significant um, economy of scale problem, for example, to get all of those upgrades to happen. So um, as Bruce said, <laughs> We haven't worked it out. We also don't have a proper functioning demand response mechanism in our wholesale market. One exists for certain types of very narrowly defined commercial and industrial demand. But for example, aggregated household demand can't currently participate in that market. That's one thing that we really need to fix is to provide better pr price incentives on aggregated household demand to shift. Um, but to my mind, the cost of VRE will continue to come down and we really need to make sure that the price incentives are there for the demand to flex in the same way that the generation varies. And we haven't got that right. Thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, moving I, I, on. Just, can, sorry. Can, yeah, sorry. Can, can I just add briefly here? Again, excellent question and very topical one. Um, uh, uh, there will be argument on this until the cows come home. Um, the cheapest source of production per um, kilowatt hour consumed undoubtedly comes from the wind or sun um, in Australia. But of course, it's a variable source of production. And the cost of firming it up varies greatly depending on the relative penetration of wind and solar, the amount of other resource you have, the interconnection, the flexibility of the load. And, and as a consequence of depending on all those things, it'll be argued about for a long time. Um, to me, 
it's relevant to keep on having the argument and learning. But the other reflection I'd have is, in practice, the easiest and quickest source of production is solar, typically rooftop solar. And in practice, when there's a demand for production, that's where it goes. And we are seeing demand aligning with production when it's cheap, um, certainly for large scale uh, um, uses, um, charging EVs and what have you. So I'm quite positive that there will be price responsive demand that will help to align these things a lot better. But it might be that there is nonetheless a policy push for nuclear or something else. Um, but I think we are a long way from that. But um, excellent question. Okay, thank you for the additional insights, Bruce. And that actually feeds very nicely into what is a, a key concern in the South African context. One of the uh, members of the audience highlighted, rightly so, that there is a big difference in terms of the context of Australia uh, and uh, in South Africa in that we are in a time of crisis, there's load shedding. And so we want the quickest solution um, to, to to really close the, um, the, the, the electricity a shortage gap whilst also tra transitioning. And there was a question here, um, not really directed at anyone, but perhaps I'll pose this to you, Anton, to say for South Africa, an immediate short-term need we have is to have perhaps a balanced uh, ag technology agnostic energy mix and to see how we carefully approach this. Uh, I, I would appreciate your, your view around what are the practical and pragmatic thoughts to how we address energy security concerns for South Africa whilst also transitioning um, towards more renewables. So obviously the top priority in South Africa is to res restore supply security and to get rid of load shedding. Uh, but we often think uh, that variable resources like solar and wind can't do that. We're, we're, whereas in our context, they would make a huge difference. So there was a very interesting study from Meridian Economics, which showed that if you uh, had added 5,000 megawatts of solar and wind, I think the modeling was in 2022, it would have uh, reduced um, load shedding by something like more than 90%. Now you say, well, how on earth is that possible? Well, if we're having load shedding more or less all the time, if you're producing through the day or whenever the wind blows, you obviously in just at that time reducing load shedding. But there was a really important secondary effect. It was that ESCOM was running out of storage, right? Because of, and, and a lot of that contributed to load shedding. So uh, having more solar during the day helps to uh, re re replenish the pump storage schemes, uh, which helps to meet the evening peak. Uh, they were running out of diesel for the, the diesel peakers. So reducing uh, the, that, that amount of load shedding as well. So there is this really important uh, uh, immediate effect. And then of course, as, as solar gets combined with, with batteries and stuff, then that also helps uh, reduce evening demand and make, makes a big impact as well. But I think without question in, in the South African context and as our, as our coal units, old coal units uh, begin to fail more and more, basically decommissioning themselves, we will need additional dispatchable resources as well. And uh, I think gas will come into the mix in, in South Africa to complement the variability of solar and wind. Thank you, Anton. Uh, I'm going to move on to Ronald. You gave an interesting presentation. I really highlighted some of the key technical considerations around what this actually means as we have more wind and solar on the grid. In your view, what, some, what are some of the key lessons from uh, the Australian approach that we've had from the Australian experts uh, to managing high penetration of solar and wind that could be applied in the South African context? I think I think I tried to articulate that in the presentation is that the um, Australia is extremely, in my view, pedantic about the details of their modeling and the quality of their modeling. They have a grid code that is over a thousand pages long, and that um, they're very strict in terms of what uh, they, they allow on their system and don't allow. Um, so compliance is key. So so you need to comply to be a good grid citizen and to make sure that you work in harmony with everybody else. And I, I think that is something that um, we, we need to appreciate is that um, 
you know, uh, as you move closer to the edge of new technologies, you have to bring those technologies up to this capabilities that they use. And you, you can't um, neglect those capabilities. You can't let people have um, uh, compliance deviations. And, and I think that's somewhere where we, we're in a bit of a tricky situation is that uh, we allow people on the grid because we've got load shedding but they don't fully comply to the requirements and the requirements aren't fully complying to international best practice. And, and this compromises the long-term uh, um, reliability of the system. And I think uh, that, uh, from Australia, they are very, very pedantic on that. And, and, I, and, and I respect that because that's what we need. If you want to go to high penetrations, you need to have a robust system that you can trust. And so, so, so th these are really important lessons from, from Australia. Thank you very much, uh, Ronald. And uh, moving on to Santla, um, I mean, you really brought the conversation home uh, down to highlighting several key issues, especially from the perspectives of the municipalities, but also touching on some key concerns around what consumers, what are the consumer perceptions and what are some of the challenges that um, municipalities are facing right now in terms of uh, actually having consumers register their systems uh, and be able to have a good sense of how you can know who has what, where, and, and then possibly move on to managing those systems uh, holistically. You also highlighted issues around affordability challenges uh, for rooftop solar in South Africa compared to the context of uh, of Australia. Perhaps maybe if you could speak more to what what could be initiatives or policies that could be implemented to make this more accessible to a wider range of South Africans as opposed to what we currently have. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and I would apologize in advance for you. Uh, asking the question, my internet become, became a very unstable, uh, but I'm, I'm going to try to respond to the last snippets of your question. Um, you know, I'm going to make some examples. You look at our, you know, inter integrated national electrification uh, program that we have right now. It's so outdated, it's not even funny. It's not responding to the current transition that we're going through. And we are still busy trying to connect people to the grid through that program. And the grid is already, you know, constrained. And we have quite a lot of, uh, you know, innovative ideas that we can use to be part of the, you know, electrification policy to increase, you know, access to, uh, you know, the, the people that don't have access to electricity as yet. And I did talk about, you know, integrated energy packages that could be sustainable to be used for those people. I mean, um, right now, um, the municipalities and maybe ESCOM as well, and not maybe, definitely ESCOM, uh, we're sitting with a lot of you know, customers that are not paying, that have uh, connected, connected themselves illegally. And that the reasons for that could be, you know, many, many issues or socioeconomic issues that we're going through. And, and, and some of them are not necessarily just because people want to steal. So we have to change policies, especially on the energy access part of things to make sure that we found creative ways to legalize what has been illegal so that we start you know, separating the customer that is not um, you know, affording you know, to pay for electricity uh, but they uh, they have a right to actually be connected to electricity. We separate them and we cross subsidize them to 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 get more sustainable energy uh, in order for these municipalities to, to can partake in the market in the future without having to drag the huge amounts of debts that they have uh, from the customers. So we still um, I think one last uh, you know parting uh, short for me is that. In South Africa, we're going to still have a lot of cross subsidization taking place. So we need to be innovative in how we actually apply that into the you know the transition that we are going through. We're not going to just go clean into the market like other countries in Europe and even Australia as well. So we have to really have our own way, but using these um, you know um, lessons that we learn in Australia, and Europe, and other countries. Uh, but um, you know, you know uh, take into consideration our our our, our situation uh, economically and the social issues that we have as well. Thanks.
Uh, thank you, Ntlantla. Uh, I, think it, I think it's very clear from the submissions we've had from uh, all the different uh, panelists that a lot is changing. And with that change, there are a lot of, there's a lot of progress that, is, that has been made in terms of um, policy reform. Uh, things are moving. Uh, I think Ntlantla spoke to a new bill, which is under consideration. And so there are a lot of moving pieces. And I'd like to find out from Anton, how important is cross-sector collaboration between the different actors, the utility, the government, the regulator, and private players in really navigating and facilitating this complex change? And what kind of timelines are we looking at to really realize this vision we have for the future of, um, of, this, of the system in South Africa? Oh, thanks, Christine. I, I mean, I think one of the deficits that we have in this country is the absence of leadership uh, in driving the reform process. Uh, reform process at a at a sort of national level and in, in unbundling ESCOM, breaking up the monopoly uh, and uh, developing a new power market. But we're getting there sort of inc inc incrementally. Uh, this uh, made reference to the Electricity Regulation Amendment Bill, which has gone through the National Assembly. Hopefully soon we'll go through the National Council of Promise, uh, Provinces. And this is the most fundamental reform that we've had in 100 years uh, since the establishment of ESCOM. So it creates an independent grid. That grid uh, company will have the not just uh, the transmission and system operation, but will also have the market operator. And then we will see the establishment of a, a power market, uh, again, in the absence of leadership, which really should be setting the high-level objectives and the principles and design of what kind of market we want to go, um, the stakeholders are effectively coming together to, to help define that. So the, the, we will see announcements soon of a series of workshops uh, which will uh, enable greater stakeholder participation and their voices heard in the design and um, at, at the principle level, but importantly, right down to the details as we finally develop the market code as, 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 as well. And uh, of course, when we design that, that market uh, and the, the, the market code, the kinds of issues that we've spoken about today will be uh, really important to incorporate. So we need to think about where these markets are going. I mean, I was quite intrigued by by both Bruce and Gabrielle's comments that you're still learning by doing uh, on, on, on many of these issues. And we need to anticipate this high, high penetration of renewables on our system and high penetration of distributed energy resources and make sure that our market design and our market code uh, incorporates those effectively. But watch this space. Uh, I, I think April, May, we will start seeing the announcements of these these stakeholder workshops and there'll be opportunity for the industry to, to participate in these discussions. Thank you. I'm not sure, Chris, how much time do we uh, do we still have for the yeah. Q&A? We have so many questions. Uh, I, I think, Christine, we're, we're 15 minutes over time already. I know that there are a lot of questions, uh, but uh, something like 60 questions have already been answered on, on, on the Q&A. I'm going to do a printout of all the questions, send them to all the uh, presenters if they want to handle some of the, uh, there's about 15 questions on the, on the Q&A that have not been dealt with. But I think we kind of at the end, Christine. Okay. So uh, perhaps maybe uh, if I could just pose an, an open question to the panel, just to see of all these things we have discussed, what do you think is the biggest challenge that South Africa has to deal with in navigating um, the growing show of renewables? What is the immediate challenge in your view, or maybe what is the immediate opportunity if if, 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 if you see it that way? Uh, any takers? Oh, I think it'll be uh, unfair of me if I said nothing, but far be it from me to pass a sweeping comment. But what I might say is, um, what I find about South Africa is it's wonderfully adaptive and responsive and inquiring. And those are the critical ingredients for success because then you learn and you adapt and you latch on and we can learn as much from you, frankly, as you can learn from us. We have um, sophistication in some areas, but the essential attributes of learning and of adaptation are ones we can learn from you. The second comment, very briefly, don't 
don't under-realize quite what you've done with an enormous uptake of distributed solar and storage. I know there's been a power crisis which has stimulated that, but that's been a benefit that the individuals that have made the investment have gained from, but there's been a communal benefit. So there was no grand plan that got you there, but you've got there through this adaptation. So be, be mindful of these fantastic achievements that happen through that adaptive spirit and just um, keep that going. Thank you, Bruce. You have a hand? Uh, Christine, I've got my hand up because I, I wanted to preempt Chris in, in the thank yous. Uh, so just before I do that, um, are there any other panel members who would like to have concluding comments? I couldn't pass a uh, comment possibly on, um, you know, any sort of judgment about South, the South African situation, but I do think um, the lesson, one of the lessons from Australia is um, all of this change will happen far faster than you anticipate and regulatory systems and policy systems naturally move very slowly and there's an opportunity there to work out how to be more flexible and nimble you know try and fail um and not just assume that the past is going to be like the future and that that anything that's ossified is like whether it's a technical standard or a revenue regulation process or a standard setting process um all of those institutional barriers can get in the way of making the transition fast and lower cost and so there's a real I think it, that's something I'm aware that this is possibly the hardest thing to ask <laughs> or propose um, and it's one that we've um, significantly had a lot of challenge with with and still continue to have so um, but yeah it just an opportunity uh, if you can possibly take it to innovate in those regards. Thank you. Uh, perhaps let me then uh, preempt you, uh, Chris, by uh, some, some thank yous here. Uh, Christine, thanks again for a really competent uh, uh, and effective way of facilitating the discussion. I want to thank particularly our Australian guests. I'm, I'm conscious it's, it's going into... Uh, the evening, your your side. So really, thank you for staying up after hours and and volunteering your time so generously. Uh, Bruce, uh, Professor Bruce Mountain played a really facilitated role when we put together the study tour and was terrific. He accompanied us uh, right through the week and helped set up the context. So thanks, Bruce, um, uh, and great great to have you back interacting with us here in South Africa and. Gabriel, we'd, we'd loved your, your presentation and your insights, uh, your obviously deep uh, involvement in the whole DER space, and of course loved your sleeping duck um, metaphors as well. I think you're going to be famous for that. Um, but thank you again for your, your, your time, um, Ronald. Uh, for, or let me rather say thanks to Pankla and Gidi first, because he was a member of that study team uh, down in Australia, and it was great having him participating. Ronald, thanks for always for your uh, truth checking, uh, bringing us to reality of some of the the real challenges that we face, and um, and just let us acknowledge the real leading role that you play around setting up our grid uh, for the future and 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 the way and you staying in contact with uh, international developments. And then lastly, Chris, just uh, thank you very much for hosting this this webinar with the Power Futures Lab of University of Cape Town. Uh, we've partnered with you uh, because of your uh, extensive stakeholder networks and, and the way in which you so effectively put together these webinars. So I uh, thank, thank you very much for that. And I guess lastly, I just need to thank once again GIZ who helped fund this whole study tour. Uh, and I think we can see some of the benefits now being more widely disseminated. So thank you all. Yeah, I think uh, you've summed it up. Um... Uh, Anton, uh, your last comments uh, in the Q&A also, uh, you know, was a great uh, summary 
uh, you know, of, of where things stand and what's got to be done and the speed at which it's got to be done. Um, so uh, I, I think the wrap up has been done. Uh, a lot of the thanks have been done. I, I just want to thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Anton Eberhard, for actually leading the study tour and thank, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the supporters uh, today. Uh, and, 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 and the Power Futures Lab in particular uh, for uh, co-hosting uh, this event with us and to our other uh, partners in this event, and in particular Investec Bank, uh, GET, Dutch Transform, GIZ, the South African German uh, Energy Program, the South African Independent Power Producers Association. It's great to have your support without which we cannot do these sort of things. Uh, the presenters have given of their time. Uh, Anton has thanked them, but uh, special thanks to Anton himself, Professor Bruton Mountain, to Gabriel Cape, Dr. Da uh, Gabriel uh, Caper, uh, to Ronald Marais. Uh, fantastic to have your very positive words uh, at this webinar, uh, giving some very solid advice, and to Nslancha and Giri for, I think, uh, really getting the municipalities uh, to embrace this uh, energy transition. Um, and see the opportunities for them with a customer, uh, you know, top of mind. Uh, thanks to all of our presenters, our sponsors, uh, our, our uh, supporters, and to all you uh, who have registered uh, to attend this webinar. You'll be getting the feedback report tomorrow. Uh, it's been a great webinar from my point of view. I think I've learned a lot, and I hope you have too. So uh, from me, it's over and out, and, um, and good afternoon uh, from, oh, good morning from Johannesburg to everybody present. Thank you.